So uh, I'm Zai Biesinger, and I want to start by recognizing the other members of the task group, uh, particularly uh, my co-chair, Mike Thomas, and John Deller, who uh, spearheads the effort to produce the report for each year. And in addition to those on, who are members of the task group, I want to recognize uh, several people who contribute to the work that happens. And uh, primarily, I want to recognize that um, the task group members, by and large, do the work, and I have the opportunity to present it on their behalf. So <clears throat> our task group has five charges, and uh, I'm going to go into more detail specifically with each one of these. I just want to, at this point, highlight the fact that uh, this year we had a new charge, number five, to develop and maintain an aquatic invasive species database. Can you still hear me like this? Okay. So I also want to put these charges in the context of some the fish community goals and objectives. And those are, the first is to maintain uh, mesotrophic conditions in the west, in the central, and the near shore eastern basin, and to maintain oligotrophic conditions in the waters of the east offshore basin. The second, to maintain a sustainable harvest of rainbow smelt in the central and east basins. Third, to maintain a diversity of forage fishes that support uh, predators of interest. And uh, fourth, to manage the food web structure and optimize production of highly valued fish species. So in the end, I'm going to come back to give kind of a report about how well we're doing in regards to these goals. So our first charge is to report on the results of the interagency lower trophic level monitoring program. And this program uh, involves taking uh, measurements from essentially the summer, from May to September. And several metrics are measured, though today I'm only going to, I'm only going to uh, present data from the first three, total phosphorus, chlorophyll A concentrations, and secchi depth water clarity. So uh, these 19 locations represent um, the areas where samples are taken throughout the course of the summer, and they cover the, the basins of, of Lake Erie. Though, actually, I should, I want to say that the reason that we talk about Lake Erie in terms of separate basins is that each basin uh, experiences different physical and chemical and biological and community characteristics, and so, uh, so we focus on these three basins and types of water individually. And as I said, for our first goal is to uh, measure these three metrics and describe the condition of the water in each of those basins. So, uh, for example, phosphorus concentrations measuring less than nine micrograms per liter are classified as waters in the oligotrophic condition. Uh, phosphorus concentrations between nine and 18 micrograms per liter get qualified as mesotrophic conditions. And similarly for chlorophyll A and for transparency. So for each of these three measures, values indicate a particular trophic status for those water bodies. And again, the goal is for the west, the central, and the near shore eastern basin to be uh, mesotrophic, and for the offshore eastern basin to be oligotrophic. <clears throat> so the... Um, in, the, in, each, in these graphs, each of those four water bodies is represented. And that yellow ribbon represents that target range, the target values for total phosphorus concentrations that we want. So for example, the West Basin has historically had higher phosphorus concentrations than uh, mesotrophic conditions would be. The basin's been more productive than we would like to see it. And in 2015, it was um, particular, the mean was particularly high, though that really high number is largely driven by uh, a single sample at two different sites at one point during the summer. Nevertheless, the Western Basin, you can see, has been and remains, to, remains more productive than we'd like to see it. The Central Basin phosphorus concentrations have been decreasing, and in the last couple of years, have been within the target range that we're after. The east offshore waters have been, I'm sorry, the east nearshore waters have been uh, 
on the lower edge, so not so lower concentrations than we would like to see. And in a similar way, the east offshore waters are in the upper range. So those waters are similar and, need, and kind of on the margin of the trophic status that we're after. So in the, simil in the same way that <clears throat> we measure uh, or that, I'm sh that we're showing a phosphorus metric, uh, the chlorophyll A concentrations. So again, that yellow ribbon represents the target range that we would like to see. And the West Basin, as before, has higher chlorophyll A concentrations than, than we're after. And uh, it's more productive than we'd like to see it. The Central Basin has been, is doing a pretty uh, good job of staying in mesotrophic conditions. The east nearshore waters are not as productive, lower chlorophyll concentrations than we'd like to see. And the east offshore waters have been um, on the upper edge of the range that we're after. And similarly for water transparency. So uh, this is measured as secchi depth. So the y-axis is, it goes from zero at the top down to eight meters at the bottom. So um, the higher on the graph, the lower the number, it means the more turbid the water is. The farther down on the graph, the clearer the water is. So, simil so the West Basin, same story. The water is murkier, it's not as clear as we would like it to be. The Central Basin is within the target secchi depth that we're after, corresponding to mesotrophic conditions. The East nearshore waters, um, uh, the secchi depth has been decreasing over the past many years, but still within that target range. And the east offshore waters have also, the secchi depth has been decreasing and during 2015 was in the range that we're after. So to take all of these three metrics together, the top table is the one that we looked at before. For each of these three metrics, values indicate that that water is in a particular trophic status. and. So recall that for, in the bottom table that's not yet filled out, for the west, the central, and the east near shore waters, the goal is for those waters to be in the mesotrophic condition, and for the east offshore waters to be in the, the oligotrophic condition. So I've color-coded the results to try and make this uh, visually interpretable. So for example, the west basin, if you recall, had that very high phosphorus concentration, and so a mean summer value of 69.2 micrograms per liter corresponds to oligotrophic hyper, excuse me, hyper eutrophic conditions. And so is color coded red. And for the West Basin, chlorophyll A concentrations fell within the eutrophic range. Transparency, secchi depth also fell within the eutrophic range. So overall, waters of the West Basin are classified as eutrophic rather than the target mesotrophic status. So similarly for the West Basin, overall that basin is classified as mesotrophic, which is uh, the target by our um, community goals and objectives. The east nearshore waters are classified as oligotrophic rather than mesotrophic, the target. And the east offshore waters are classified as we would like them to be oligotrophic. So our second charge is to describe the status and trends of forage fish in the lake. And I'll uh, address these per, um, by basin. So in the West Basin, this map just represents the locations of the partnership trawl, the 70 locations that takes place each summer. <coughs> and uh, this figure represents the um, the catches from those trawls aggregated by functional groups. So spiny rayed species, soft rayed species, and clupeid. And you can see that in the past couple of years, overall abundance of forage fish has been decreasing in the Western Basin. And it's largely comprised of spiny rayed species. Though looking back over the time series, 2015 is not really that different from uh, the variation that we've seen over the past decades. And to look at just a couple, I guess four, to look at just four particular species out of all these, this figure, the arrows on this figure are meant to represent the abundance of that species relative to the 10-year mean, just to give an idea of how that species is, uh, has been changing. 
So for example, Shiner and Gobi are, their 2015 abundance falls far below the, their 10 year mean abundance. Shad are a bit above their 10 year mean and white perch are a bit below their 10 year mean. So in the central basin, uh, the, this map shows the locations of these 47 trawls. I think I've forgotten the number exactly, but some, the number of trawls that take place in Ohio and Pennsylvania waters in the central basin. And um, in, a similar, in a similar graph, the functional groups of species are represented by different colors along the time series of this, of this trawl. And you can see that uh, in the past, few years, overall abundance has been decreasing, and abundance is, in this basin is largely driven by smelt abundance. Though, again, uh, comparing the 2015 abundances to the overall time series, it's uh, kind of within the variation that we have seen a bit on the low end. And to highlight just, a f just four uh, species, again, the arrows represent how that species is doing relative to its 10-year mean. So as an example, Shiner in Ohio waters uh, have, in 2015, are below their 10-year mean, but in Pennsylvania waters, they're about the same. So you can see that it's kind of a mixed bag with some species being uh, above their mean, their 10-year mean, some below, and some about the same, depending on the species and the jurisdiction. In the Eastern Basin, uh, this figure represents the the trawls that have taken place in the Pennsylvania, the New York waters, and in the Ontario offshore and near shore waters. <clears throat> so uh, because the Ontario waters and the, I guess, the Canadian versus the US waters are a bit different, we have separated um, the abundance estimates for those two, those two groups of, of surveys. And so, for example, in, in Ontario waters, in 2015, the overall abundance of foraged species has gone up and is largely driven by smelt. And, uh, but looking back at the variation of the time series, it's not drastically different from what we've seen in the past. And because of the differences in uh, the scales of the y-axis, the abundance, the overall abundance in New York state waters is more or less the same this year as it was in uh, Ontario waters, and again, largely driven by smelt. So to highlight just a few of these interesting, most interesting species, smelt, young of the year smelt uh, were above their 10 year mean in both Ontario and New York waters, though year and older smelt were uh, more abundant in Ontario waters and less abundant in New York waters, and Shiner were below their 10 year mean overall and Gobi, depending on where you were, they were either above or below. So it's very similar. It's kind of a, a mixed story about forage abundance throughout the East Basin and throughout Lake Erie. Our third charge is to continue the hydroacoustic assessment of pelagic forage fish community. <clears throat> and in this figure and the few to follow, the solid lines represent the transects followed by the vessel as they collected hydroacoustic data. And the, diam the diameter of the bubble represents the abundance of, uh, of in this case, overall forage fish density. In the Western Basin, there's not an accompanying trawl to uh, separate fish abundance by species or estimate fish abundance by species. So this is, uh, this figure just represents the overall abundance of forage fish. And you can see that, um, in the southern half of the central trawl, uh, that portion of the trawl, was no data was actually collected there because of bad weather conditions. Otherwise, forage fish density was relatively um, uniform through, f forage fish were found relatively uniformly throughout the Western Basin. And abundance was more or less, um, as you can see it, in sometimes higher densities in the, lower, in the southern end and sometimes in the northern end, but overall, relatively well distributed through the Western Basin. If you look at uh, these abundance estimates back through time, forage fish, the density, the number of individuals was quite high in 2015 relative to the last 10 years. And if you look rather at the forage biomass, it's, it's not really 
it doesn't reflect that same thing. So this is an issue of numbers of fish versus uh, size and density of fish. So, um, so this is what we observed in the Western Basin in 2015. In the Central Basin, again, these four transects conducted by uh, hydroacoustic survey, the size, the diameter of the bubble represents the density. And because of accompanying um, trawls, it's possible to distinguish age zero smelt from age one smelt. So the figure on the left represents the density of those age zero smelt. And you can see that they're relatively well distributed through the central basin, with the exception of the southern half of the western, the western transect, where age zero smelt seem to be uh, to have disappeared, and instead they're replaced by the abundance of older smelt, age one and older, which which show up in the the right hand figure. So that transect was completed. Just so happens that they were segrega segregated relatively well by age. Uh, as, and um, shiner densities along these same transects were very low, and in fact almost exclusively found along the Ontario shoreline. In the Eastern Basin, six transects were conducted. Uh, the, the remaining six intended transects were not successfully collected. And data from, tw from these surveys, the Eastern Basin surveys from 2015 and 2014, aren't finished. The anal analysis is not finished, but should be done in the coming months. Our force charge is to report on the use of forage fish and new invasive species in the diets of selected predator, predator fish. So, it, so I'm just going to highlight a few of the uh, species of most interest in, for this charge. In the Western Basin, walleye diets were largely dominated by gizzard shad. Yellow perch diets were dominated by benthic invertebrates in the summertime. and uh, um, with increases in zooplankton and other fish species into the fall. In the central basin, again, walleye diets were primarily dominated by gizzard shad, but more emerald shiner. Yellow perch diets were dominated by zooplankton and benthic invertebrates. And uh, in this basin, round goby continue to be an important diet item for smallmouth bass. In the Eastern Basin, walleye diets were primarily dominated by uh, rainbow smelt. Round goby uh, were a dominant prey item for many of the near shore predators and were found in over 65% of the diets of smallmouth bass and yellow perch. And, uh, and then burbot diets and lake trout diets were found to include round goby and rainbow smelt in various proportions. So our fifth charge is to document this, and this I should say, uh, this year was a new charge for our task group, and it was to dominate new species of interest, um, or to document. Did I say dominate? <laughs> we're to document. <laughs> uh, we're to document um, new species of interest, fish, um, as well as shellfish and vertebrates and plants, and to develop a, a database and a way to. Uh, begin to pay attention and keep track of these in, um, invasive and potentially invasive species with a, a particular focus on those species that are have the highest potential to negatively impact our fisheries. So uh, I just want to highlight the things that we've accomplished this year. And the first was to develop a, a long list of species of concern, species that are potentially invasive to Lake Erie, and um, something that we need to pay attention to as well as a short list of species of higher concern that are either um, beginning to establish or step into Lake Erie or you know, knocking on the doorstep, those species that really should um, receive some attention and some focus. We've also prepared an Asian carp fact sheet as part of this new charge. And we have also recommended new membership of a couple of new We've recommended membership of a couple of new, the sentence is not coming out right. We've recommended a couple of new people to uh, 
receive membership on our task group with particular expertise in aquatic invasive species. So uh, in, the la in the final few minutes, I want to kind of revisit these charges and the work and put them back in the context of our fish community goals and objectives. And so if you recall, the first goal was to um, maintain particular trophic status for the basins of the water. And so this table is a simplified version of what we've seen, that the West Basin currently is qualified as uh, being in eutrophic status instead of the target mesotrophic status. So that basin is not where we'd like it to be. Similarly, with the east nearshore waters, they're not in the trophic status that we're after. But the central and the east offshore waters, the central basin and the east offshore waters, are where we would like to see them. So there's kind of a mixed result for that particular goal. The second goal is to maintain a sustainable harvest of rainbow smelt in the central and east basin. And uh, they do, rainbow smelt continue to be the main forage item in the eastern basin and an important component in the central basin. So we're doing pretty well for that charge. Our third charge to maintain a diversity of forage fish to support uh, predators of interest. Um, forage fish diversity remains high across all basins of Lake Erie, so uh, that charge seems to be doing relatively well. The fourth charge to manage the food web structure to optimize production of highly valued fish species. Growth rates of walleye, of yellow perch, smallmouth bass, and, and lake trout remained high. And uh, so a lot of these species of interest seem to be um, doing relatively well. Invasive species such as round goby are, are continue to be contributing to um, several of these species making a contribution to their diets. And as I close, I would like to just recognize my one of the a long-term task group member and uh, currently serving as a co-chair, Mike Thomas, who will be retiring this year. And I want to, between his retirement this year and uh, Larry Witzel's retirement last year, the the loss of these two task members represents decades of, not so many, not too many decades, but represents a substantial loss to uh, the institutional knowledge in our task group. And so I'd like to uh, recognize Mike and thank him for his contribution and his service to the task group. And finally, of course, uh, the group has produced a, a report and an executive summary, which you can get from the website or if you speak with any of our task group members, we can help you get copies of those. And that's all I have, so if there are any questions.